Welcome to the first episode of the Fast Track Cities podcast series. I am Dr. Jose Zuniga, and I'm the president of the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care, or IAPAC. This series of podcasts exists because IAPAC is dedicated to chronicling the history of the urban AIDS response. Our journey will begin with the darkest days of the global HIV epidemic in the early 1980s. It will wind its way through to today as cities fast track their AIDS responses to end AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. Throughout this podcast series, we will hear from local heroes who have been on the front lines of the urban AIDS response. IAPAC is proud to tell their stories. This first episode offers a window into the HIV epidemic's early days. It does so from the perspective of cities that were ground zero for a new infectious disease that would explode into a global pandemic. Five months after Ronald Reagan became America's 40th president, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, issued a report about the emergence of several cases of an uncommon form of pneumonia in the Los Angeles area. All the individuals who were diagnosed with the condition identified as young gay men. Although the CDC's report went largely unnoticed in June 1981, it heralded the arrival of the most devastating epidemic of modern time. Within 15 years, the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or AIDS, would become the leading cause of death among Americans between the ages of 25 and 44. But AIDS observes no boundaries, geographic or otherwise. To date, AIDS has claimed over 40 million lives around the world. And as of December 2017, an estimated 37 million people are living with HIV. The virus we now know causes AIDS. This podcast episode is the first in a new series brought to you by the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care, IAPAC. It focuses on a global strategy to support cities fighting on the front lines of the battle against HIV AIDS. This unified worldwide effort was born in the midst of the devastation of the early days of the AIDS crisis and was given a new shot of adrenaline by the Fast Track Cities Initiative, launched on World AIDS Day 2014. The initiative's aim is to leverage the unique role of cities to end AIDS-related deaths, curb new HIV infections, and eliminate stigma and discrimination. During this first podcast episode, you will hear from IAPAC's partners, as well as from dozens of members from around the world. They will discuss the past, present, and future of the global AIDS response that began nearly four decades ago with a special focus on how cities are leading the way in fighting the epidemic. The recorded history of HIV began on June 5, 1981, with a CDC report entitled Pneumocystis Pneumonia, Los Angeles a title that hardly portends the global pandemic that would soon devastate millions of people and their communities. We start this podcast episode with Dr. Harold Jaffe, the CDC's Associate Director for Science. He served as an epidemiologist for the health agency when HIV-AIDS emerged in the 1980s and was assigned to the CDC's first task force to investigate the new disease. HIV AIDS started out as a medical mystery. The first report was received in the spring of 1981. It was a report of five young, previously healthy homosexual men seen in Los Angeles with pneumocystis pneumonia. And this seemed very odd because pneumocystis pneumonia in the past had really only occurred in people with some obvious cause of immune suppression, such as an organ transplant or cancer chemotherapy, but these men had none of those risk factors. Uh, that report was published in the MMWR in uh, June 1981, and a month later came additional reports of Kaposi's sarcoma, also seen in young gay men. So over the summer of 1981, CDC established a national case surveillance system, which found cases occurring in a number of large American cities and uh, cases uh, that had not been previously recognized. For Dr. Tony Fauci, the summer of 1981 marked a defining moment in his career at the U.S. National Institutes of Health, where he would oversee the U.S. government's research effort as a director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. From that point forward, he started down a journey, both as a scientist and eventually 
as an activist to end AIDS. Uh, my first engagement in the AIDS response was actually at the very, very beginning. It was the summer of 1981. I was at the National Institutes of Health in my office just a few feet from my ward where I see patients and my laboratory. And it was June of 1981, and I saw the first MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report from the CDC, reporting the first five men who had pneumocystis pneumonia from Los Angeles. I thought it was a bit of a fluke. I'm not sure what it meant. So I put it aside. And then one month later, in July of 1981, when the 26 cases, now curiously, again, all gay men, not only from L.A., but from San Francisco and New York, not only presenting with pneumocystis, but with Kaposi sarcoma and other opportunistic infections, I made a decision at the end of July that this was a new disease and that I was going to literally transform and convert my activities, which was studying the immune responses to infections and the regulation of the human immune response, and to then say that I was going to start admitting these men who were being now reported in different cities, particularly San Francisco, L.A., and New York, and start the AIDS program at the NIH, which I did literally in the summer and the fall of 1981. So I did it like literally within weeks of reading the two MMWR reports because I was convinced even though none of us had any idea uh, what this was, to me and to others it just smelled like a virus uh, that we certainly were not identifying. No one knew what it was. And it was attacking the immune system. So as a person who was trained both in immunology and in infectious diseases, I felt this was something I had to do, and I did it, and that's where it was. It was literally at the NIH in the summer of 1981. Investigations by the CDC discovered that people suffering from profound immune suppression were vulnerable to a host of diseases and conditions that were uncommon among people with healthy immune systems. Even before the cause of AIDS was identified, CDC investigators determined that it was transmissible during sexual intercourse, through blood transfusions, as a result of injecting drug use, and from mother to newborn. When the earliest cases of AIDS were reported in the United States, public health officials began to refer to the disease as gay-related immune deficiency, or GRID. This reference to what was also referred to as a gay cancer caused panic within gay communities around the world and threatened to further stigmatize an already highly stigmatized part of society. In 1982, the CDC adopted a new acronym, AIDS, for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. But the damage was done. The early history of AIDS would have important ramifications for public perceptions of the disease. At its onset, AIDS was regarded as an American disease, and the early association of AIDS with gay men has persisted into the 21st century. Dr. David Sirwada, a professor at the Makerere University School of Public Health in Uganda, remembers how early alarms about HIV in his country often went unheeded because of prevailing perceptions about the disease. There was a lot of pushback by the government in Uganda they didn't want to accept or believe that this is a problem here simply because, A, they thought this was a problem in America among white homosexual men, and B, they, they did not like to get the attention visited upon those countries that actually declared that they had HIV in, in their country. So there was a lot of pushback and denial around the existence of the disease, which was very frustrating for us who were really starting to see that we really had a problem. And uh, that later on cost us dearly because the initiation of HIV prevention programs really delayed, and that really gave an opportunity for HIV to take root into into Uganda. By the mid-1980s, HIV had already developed into a worldwide pandemic. Although AIDS was first reported in the 1980s, it was not, in fact, an altogether new disease. 
HIV was circulating among humans in what is now known as the Democratic Republic of Congo, or DRC, as early as the 1920s. Scientists say that a perfect storm of population growth, sex, and railways allowed HIV to spread from Kinshasa, DRC's capital city, to neighboring regions. So while HIV came to global attention in the 1980s, it extended beyond national borders much earlier, appearing in the Americas, for example, in the 1960s, and quietly mounting its lethal attack on unsuspecting people. And although the first reported cases of AIDS were among gay men, data indicate that heterosexual intercourse is the HIV epidemic's primary means of transmission worldwide. Before you can respond to a burgeoning pandemic, you must know its cause. Scientists sought to identify the causative agents for AIDS. Researchers in France and the United States independently isolated the virus that became known as Human Immunodeficiency Virus, or HIV. Doctors Luc Montagnier and Françoise barry Sanusi of the Pasteur Institute in Paris were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their discovery of HIV. Their work allowed for the development of testing for the presence of antibodies associated with HIV infection, without which HIV-infected individuals remain unaware of their status. Urban areas were struck especially hard by the HIV epidemic. During the 1980s and through the 1990s, New York City accounted for one in every eight AIDS cases in the United States. Dr. Donna Futterman directs the Adolescent AIDS Program at the Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, New York. She was a medical student when the HIV epidemic first emerged in New York City. She recalls the all-hands-on-deck approach that a committed group of veteran doctors and medical students developed in the face of the early AIDS onslaught. I was in medical school at the time in the early 1980s when it came to our attention. And again, we didn't know what to do besides be there at the bedsides of our patients, be there to help them through what for most was a close to inevitable death sentence. It was very different from what we expected our role as medical students and doctors to be, but yet it was very fulfilling as a health professional to be able to be there and help someone support them through what was the most difficult thing. The San Francisco metropolitan area was also profoundly affected. At the height of the HIV epidemic in the 1980s, as many as one in every two gay men in San Francisco was infected with HIV. Dr. Susan Buckbinder, who is now a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, or UCSF, also witnessed the tragic results firsthand when she was a medical student at UCSF. San Francisco was one of the major epicenters of the epidemic to begin with. It was always in the top uh, few cities most heavily impacted by the HIV epidemic. Uh, in fact, it just was it, New York, LA, San Francisco were uh, really, really heavily impacted by the epidemic uh, in the very early days. Physicians, nurses, and other healthcare workers were among the first responders to this epidemic. In the 1980s, a group of 500 clinicians joined forces to create the first association of HIV health workers, the Physicians Association in AIDS Care, or PAC. This association would eventually expand into the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care, or IAPAC. Today, IAPAC has more than 30,000 members worldwide, providing healthcare services for HIV, viral hepatitis, tuberculosis, and other related conditions. IAPAC's membership stretches across more than 150 countries. IAPAC's president, Dr. Jose Zuniga, recalls the early history of PAC and IAPAC and why he was attracted to join the association's ranks in the mid-1990s. I immediately believed in the mission that had been set forth really by the earlier stages of IAPAC, which was the Physicians Association in AIDS Care, 
It had been started, well, over 35 years ago as a small group of clinicians who got together and decided that they could marshal themselves and the, and, uh, the credibility of other clinicians to have an impact on the epidemic in the early days when there were no treatment options. And so PAC was engaged in educating clinicians around nutrition and what we call palliative care and end-of-life care for folks who were dying rather rather quickly after their HIV diagnosis. PAC was also deeply engaged in fighting the AMA, the American Medical Association, and the American Dental Association when they tried to push through legislation and policies that would have discriminated against HIV-positive physicians or other healthcare providers, as well as dentists, insisting that they should not be caring for the general population. PAC's efforts, along with a very small number of other like-minded institutions, succeeded uh, in defeating these, these measures. What began in 1981 as a medical mystery quickly morphed into a full-blown public health crisis. AIDS cases and AIDS-related deaths rapidly escalated. One of IAPAC's pioneer members, Dr. Renslow Schurer, a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago, recalls the spread of AIDS cases across Chicago. And we had 140 cases in the first four years, so it started slowly. And then in the next four or five years, we went up to a census of 1,800 in our clinic. It exploded. Dr. Susan Bookbinder witnessed the epidemic's rapid escalation firsthand in San Francisco. The, the epidemic really started in the late 70s. We had infections that we projected went back to 77, 78, and then it just started taking off. And it really, unfortunately, the AIDS cases peaked in 1992 um, with uh, over 2,300 new AIDS diagnoses in that year. Between 1982 to 1996, the number of AIDS cases across the United States rose 15-fold. The national response lagged far behind the spread of the disease and its mounting death toll. President Reagan would make his first public comments about the AIDS crisis in April 1987, six years after the CDC's initial report. By that time, an estimated 30,000 Americans were already living with HIV. Our battle against AIDS has been like an emergency room operation. We've thrown everything we have into it. We've declared AIDS public health enemy number one. I'm determined that we'll find a cure for AIDS. In that year, the U.S. Congress allocated $416 million in federal spending which was primarily prioritized for AIDS research at the National Institutes of Health. This figure was double what the Reagan administration had requested, but certainly not enough to match the nation's HIV education, care, treatment, and support needs. At the same time that the U.S. government failed to recognize the scale and scope of the threat that HIV posed, the AIDS crisis continued to devastate the lives of many more Americans. Longtime AIDS activist Peter Staley, who lives in New York, is one of the lucky ones, as he has lived with an HIV diagnosis for more than three decades. But he recalls how his HIV diagnosis upended his life and put him on the road to activism. Well, I was caught off guard by my diagnosis in the fall of 85. I uh, just went to my doctor with a cough. Turned out to just be a cold, but I happened to have a gay doctor who was, uh, unbeknownst to me, already on the front lines of the AIDS crisis with many of his patients uh, suffering from the disease and, and dying. So uh, anytime any of his gay male patients came in with anything, he would run a CBC, a complete blood count. And that's how we found out, because I had a low white blood cell count, and that led to further tests. So... Uh, for me, it was a uh, upending of my life, basically. Uh, I was foolishly on this <laughs> track of thinking I could stay in the closet the rest of my life and continue working on Wall Street as a bond trader and maybe get into politics later in life. And I had to throw away that entire uh, playbook and figure out how to wait to just buy some time, uh, some months or maybe years, because uh, I had just been handed a two-year death sentence, basically. On the front lines of the fight, 
America's cities took the lead in responding to the health emergency. Local health departments created special units that were devoted full-time to fighting the disease. In New York, city leaders created an agency to help people living with HIV locate financial support, housing, and health care. San Francisco founded the first clinic specifically dedicated to HIV treatment. Its community-centered model of care has since been replicated around the world. Recognizing cities' unique ability to respond early to HIV, the U.S. government eventually created a national safety net program, the Ryan White Care Act, to provide emergency assistance to hard-hit cities. Dr. Michael Carfin, who is currently Senior Deputy Director of HIV AIDS, Hepatitis, STD, and TB Administration at the Department of Health in Washington, D.C., recalls how community organizations with local governments first began responding to urban HIV epidemics. The response, I think, was one that at the time we didn't have national leadership to respond to this health crisis, which was also a conflicting and enraging experience because most public health crises, the leadership and the response had come from public health authorities at the federal level and the state level. And what we were experiencing with HIV in the United States overall was we didn't have a national leadership and that most communities were kind of scrambling on their own. Gay and other communities created AIDS service organizations in the epidemic's early years that continue to play a vital role in local responses to this day. Organizations such as the Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York City, as well as the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. In Atlanta, a volunteer group of women created Sister Love, which took on the challenge of addressing the unique needs of a specific vulnerable population, women. For Dezan Dixon Diallo, Sister Love's founder and current CEO, organizing her community of disenfranchised, mostly African-American women was a priority. We started Sister Love because it uh, wasn't even a priority in the women's center where I work. And uh, we had a lot of women who were calling us and didn't know where to go. And for the local aid service organization that we did have, they were ill-equipped and unprepared to respond to what women needed, what women needed to know, what women needed in terms of their own health care, where to go. Um, and we ended up starting the first support group for women. We started the first prevention programming uh, for women. We also became fierce. Sister Love was sort of the local or the southern um, face of the ACT UP movement to get women included in the epidemic. This model of community engagement would be replicated globally over the coming years. Yet despite these efforts of communities and local governments to respond, the global HIV epidemic continued to pick up its pace. As the number of people living with HIV in the United States escalated, the epidemic's impact began to become more apparent in other cities across the country. In Denver, Local leaders promoted the active engagement of people living with HIV. This concept became a key feature of the Denver Principles, which were released in 1983. Dr. Sarah Rowan, an infectious disease physician in Denver, explains. Uh, Denver developed the Denver Principles, which was a guiding set of principles that's been used internationally um, to sort of lead how we approach the epidemic. Um, Denver's also been a leader in terms of coordinating our, some of our surveillance so that we have an organized response and we um, work well between our different agencies. So we feel that we've been a leader in um, both sort of addressing the epidemic early on and then kind of carrying our progress forward. One of the most striking features of city leadership on AIDS has been the working partnership created between municipal offices and community leaders. Communities affected by HIV pioneered new forms of health activism outside the walls of existing government institutions. ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, was formed in 1987 in New York, and ACT UP chapters soon emerged around the world. 
Peter Staley, who took part in a 1988 ACT UP demonstration on Wall Street on the first anniversary of the group, describes the extraordinary empowerment that ACT UP brought to communities under siege. It was people power at its, at its most glorious uh, that really drove all the victories that we had during those years. Uh, if we didn't have the queer community in, in this country kind of rise up en masse to drive a movement over not just a few months, but 10, 15 years during those plague years, if we didn't have that movement, that communal response, that people power, we wouldn't have had any of the victories. Individuals acting on their own trying to do this would have accomplished very little. It was only after the groundwork set by these large demonstrations, civil disobedience, the willingness of us to put our bodies into the street that opened all the doors for the activists to come in and push for the victories that we ultimately achieved. Charles King, the founder and executive director of Housing Works, a nonprofit organization in New York, recalls how an acute sense of urgency compelled activists to fight for a stronger response to the AIDS crisis. I went to law school after a year of driving buses and ended up um, getting arrested for the first time in an HIV-related demonstration at, at the uh, uh, first anniversary, ACT UP's first anniversary demonstration at City Hall. And... Um, you know, it was it was just an incredible, incredible time. Uh, there was, um, you know, my my whole community became ACT UP, and um, you, you know, it was a time of intense fear, a time of intense um, anger and rage, and yet a time of. Um, enormous creativity and and love and um, people coming together because we we all felt like we were fighting for our lives and if we didn't uh, if we didn't take up the fight no one else was was going to as already noted neither the HIV epidemic's impact nor the critical role played by cities in fighting the disease proved to be solely an American phenomenon across Western Europe Cities grappled with a rapid rise of HIV-AIDS cases in the 1980s. Amsterdam, London, Madrid, and across the region. Amsterdam, for example, created the world's first needle exchange program to prevent transmission of HIV through injecting drug use. In 1982, the Terence Higgins Trust was established in London to raise funds for AIDS research and to provide community-based care for people living with AIDS and Madrid created safe spaces for users of intravenous drugs to help prevent the sharing of contaminated needles. Dr. Santiago Moreno was a young infectious diseases specialist in the early 1980s, confronted with a growing HIV epidemic in Madrid among people who use drugs. He recalls the city's early and occasionally unorthodox response to the new epidemic. But in Madrid, the epidemics was mainly driven by sharing, sharing needles. And then the response was, some, was somehow different because, you know, what we had to face then was not only the problem of HIV infection, but also the problem of drug addiction. Imagine when a patient came to the hospital, you had to take care of him, the opportunity infection, the disease, but then opiate substitution program, you know, all the trouble that these patients create in the hospital. So not many people wanted to see them because in addition to have, you know, a, a disastrous uh, disease, had a, disaster, a disastrous life. What we had to invent was a program that was not very well seen, you know, in, 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 by society, but we had to invent a program of sharing needles. I mean, the needle exchange program in which they brought to the pharmacy a used syringe and needle, and then they were given, you know, a clean one. So that at least they wouldn't share, you know, the contaminated needle. Or in Madrid, then they, they built this a special place to inject drugs, to inject heroin, where they could go there with their heroin, and then they were provided clean equipment for injection. Dr. Peter Reese 
a professor of medicine at the university of amsterdam's academic medical center in the netherlands describes the emotional impact that the early years of aids had on health care workers who had few ways to relieve the suffering of their very young patients like in many other places those early days were scary because here we were seeing people mostly our own age as young doctors and they were very seriously ill and things didn't end well for them and then in those very early days the cause wasn't clear yes probably an infection but how was it being transmitted so there was also the scare on the healthcare staff is this something that we could catch ourselves dr santiago moreno recalls the sorrow of knowing that nearly all of his patients in Madrid were going to die. When they came to the clinic, you knew they were going to die. And most of them, for the first time they came, many of them were healthy. And it was very hard you know, to look at them. You know, they're the same guy that once came to your clinic and you connected very well with him because he was young you know, and it could be you there and he was healthy and was doing a normal life, studying, working, whatever. And then you were thinking that within a few months, or in the best of the case, in years, he would die. He would die of AIDS and suffering. And that, was, that was very, 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 very hard. That was very, very hard, you know, to accept that. And in fact, it was like a barrier, a defense, not, not to accept that and not to be too near, too close. To the, to, to, to the patients, because at the end you were suffering. You were suffering as well. And there were some of these people that you cannot, you know, avoid becoming friends and wanting, loving them. And at the end, that, 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 that was true, true suffering with, with them. And I can recall many of the patients that we lost in those times. And along with an HIV diagnosis itself, often came stigma, discrimination, and internalized shame in the epidemic's early years. Here again is Dr. Moreno. But at that time, it was a bad new to have AIDS, is to tell your family how you got AIDS. Because, you know, homosexuality then, people who had sex with men, that, that couldn't be confessed at those times. I think one of the good things that HIV, AIDS has brought is the fact that now sexual relationships are seen in a different way. The homosexual community claim for their rights, and now it's seen like something near normal in most societies. But not at those times. I remember some kids that got HIV by sex, even girls, and they were more afraid of telling the family that they were homosexual than they were HIV positive. For Anna Zakowitz, deputy bureau chief at AHF Europe, the stigma associated with HIV is one perpetuated by a notion of otherness. I think the question is why we are creating differences, right? And I think it's because we are who we are <laughs> as, as, as people. And uh, we like to compare ourselves and we want to be better. And, uh, and some, some people are better and some people are worse, right? And, and then key affected populations are somehow labeled because of, because of behavior. And as we are living in a society, it uh, very often does not, uh, does not respect uh, differences. That is even more difficult. And then if we do not respect differences, we create laws that make the situation for people who engage in certain behaviors, uh, we make uh, the, the life even more difficult. But I think the question is about understanding choices. And I'm not really sure that we as communities, we, we really uh, accept uh, people's choices and we are open to this because looking as how, how we live or how we are, we are quite restrictive and uh, how strict towards uh, behaviors that uh, we do not agree with. And then it translates into challenges that people experience uh, when accessing care. Although HIV AIDS would have its most devastating effect in sub-Saharan Africa, recognition of the health crisis in that region was delayed in the 1980s. By the time the breadth of the HIV epidemic in the region was recognized, it was already a full-blown public health emergency. Dr. Linda Gale Becker, Deputy Director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center in South Africa, recalls the epidemic's early years in Cape Town. 
Yes, so I um, the early days of the epidemic in Cape Town was much like the Southern African emergency, I guess. Um, I was a young clinician, late 80s, when I first became aware that this terrible new epidemic was breaking. Um, I actually found myself as a young doctor up in northern KwaZulu-Natal, which really has become the epicenter of the epidemic, I guess, worldwide. And um, recognised that the wards were just full of young people dying. And it changed my career because I, at that point, had hoped to be a geriatrician. Um, and, and on a moment decided that I needed to understand this new infectious disease. No region was immune. HIV AIDS had an impact on the Asia Pacific region as well. The first AIDS case in Thailand was diagnosed in 1984, and it was soon clear that the capital city of Bangkok would be the most heavily affected. Here is Dr. Prafen Phanupak, director of the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center, who diagnosed the very first cases in Bangkok. But at that time, in the early uh, 1985, it was, uh, I think it's uh, similar to, to, to everywhere. AIDS uh, is a deadly disease, uh, horrible, uh, you know, everyone will die, very uh, easy to, to, to transmit to other people. Uh, people who are HIV infected are, are bad persons, i.e. stigma related to HIV, for example, drug users, sex workers, uh, uh, men having sex with men, and so on. So people were very afraid of, of being even being associated with HIV. And as uh, we know, at that time, there was no effective medication to treat uh, AIDS, so many people died. For example, in every village in the northern part of Thailand, there will be one young man or young woman die every week. So that's a, co a quite difficult story uh, at that time. Cities in Australia were also moved to respond to the new epidemic. Dr. Sharon Lewin is the director of the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity of Melbourne, Australia. As occurred in many parts of the world, the early days of HIV in Melbourne were very grim. Uh, the first diagnoses of HIV were in the early 80s. Uh, there was no treatment available. Uh, most people were cared for in a dedicated infectious diseases hospital called Fairfield Infectious Diseases Hospital, which was a wonderful hospital, which um, really delivered outstanding care to people that were very marginalised and had no treatment options. Uh, unfortunately, that hospital actually closed in the mid-90s, but that uh, legacy of outstanding care for HIV in a strong research and clinical community continues on in Melbourne. Doctors and nurses are dedicated to restoring their patients' health. However, they were often overwhelmed by a complete lack of treatment options in the early days of AIDS. It was no exaggeration at that time to say that an AIDS diagnosis was a death sentence. Dr. Renslow Schur remembers this dark time in the epidemic's history as he struggled with the rising AIDS-related death toll in Chicago. The only treatments were of the opportunistic infections. We could help people, but we couldn't cure them. And I, I estimated that I saw 3,000 patients over the first decade with HIV at the county, and they all died. And it was just devastating. For Dr. Susan Buckbinder, the tragedy of those early days became a focal point for strengthening San Francisco's social bonds. It was just a horrific time where uh, people were just dying um, repeatedly and they were all could have been you know uh, siblings of mine that were dying and so it was it was a very distressing very uh, challenging time and yet it also was a time that the community really came together and rallied together to, to care for each other and uh, and to advocate for change just as HIV itself knew no boundaries the despair of the epidemics early years was felt in every part of the world. Dr. Elizabeth Bukusi, Chief Research Officer at the Kenya Medical Research Institute in Nairobi, remembers the despair and loss of hope. The early days were very sad. As we diagnosed individuals with HIV, we had very little to offer them. We did what was called home-based care, 
essentially it was doing our best to give people a dignified way to die because we had very little that we could do beyond giving them nutritional advice, counseling them and supporting them through the very difficult challenges of wasting away. People needed to have hope that tomorrow could be better than today and we didn't have anything to give them to hang on to. Nowhere in sub-Saharan Africa was spared from the devastation, including the coastal city of Cape Town, South Africa, as Dr. Linda Gale Becker recalls. But those were dark days. We watched a, an epidemic ravage uh, homes, communities, um, the whole nation, in fact. Dr. Pedro Khan, an infectious disease specialist in Buenos Aires, has similar memories of the epidemic spread in Argentina. And uh, at the same time, different from the first, uh, the first years in which people came to the hospital very sick and they died eventually in a couple of months, now we started to see patients that, we, that, that were perfectly uh, healthy. They had a test that said, yes, you are HIV positive. But in front of our eyes, as time went by, we saw how they deteriorate, and they lose weight, and they start having diarrhea and fever, and you know it's completely different because we we had a close contact with them because you follow those patients year by year, so you know the family, you know the partners, etc. So it was a very tough time. For the first decade and a half after the initial appearance of AIDS, the global response to AIDS was led by the World Health Organization. Dr. Jonathan Mann, the leader of the WHO's Global Program on AIDS in the 1980s, had a profound effect on how the response to AIDS would evolve. Focusing not merely on the epidemiology and medical aspects of the disease, Dr. Mann emphasized that the spread of HIV was abetted by widespread violations of human rights and that only a response grounded in human rights and the dignity of every person would reach the marginalized communities most heavily affected. Dr. Jose Zuniga from IAPAC recalls working with Dr. Mann in the mid-1990s. Dr. Mann was one of the IAPAC's founding members and a public health icon who promoted a human rights-based approach to combating HIV-AIDS. Fulfilling this mandate became an integral part of IAPAC's mission. This mandate was really a reflection of the rights-based approach that Jonathan Mann, one of the earliest founding members of IAPAC and consider the architect of the global mobilization against AIDS had promoted, which was in essence that in the face of political paralysis by political leaders and health officials worldwide, we needed to project an image of the epidemic that could be controlled. He was very adamant that our problem was not only a viral disease, but a social problem that needed to be solved. By the mid-1990s, international donors and thought leaders decided that governance of the global AIDS response needed to more clearly reflect the multifaceted nature of the challenge. Rather than centralize the global AIDS fight within the United Nations dedicated health agency, it was decided instead to create a new agency, the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, or UN AIDS. Here is the executive director of UN AIDS, Michelle Sidibe. I think uh, I, I was uh, lucky to come after one of few great uh, leaders, uh, Jonathan Mann and also Peter Piot. They were already bringing the whole debate around exceptionalism of uh, HIV AIDS. And uh, I, I build on what I learned from them to really focus on uh, a few specific visions. Uh, one is zero new infection, uh, zero discrimination, uh, zero uh, death due to AIDS. In reality, uh, it was to push the world to think about uh, inclusiveness to push the world to make sure that uh, zero, zero, zero will not be just a magic world, but it is about social justice. Until 1996, prospects for treating HIV advanced slowly. AZT, a drug initially developed to treat cancer, was approved in 1987 for the treatment of HIV. 
Although the drug appeared to slow the progression of the disease for a time, it ultimately proved to have limited value in prolonging life. Additional drugs were approved for HIV treatment, and doctors began having their patients take two drugs in combination. But the results were still disappointing. AIDS-related deaths in the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, and other developed world countries reached their highest level in 1995. Thankfully, by the mid-1990s, a profound shift in the worldwide response to the crisis had begun to take shape. Although many observers concluded that high rates of AIDS-related deaths were simply an unalterable and permanent feature of modern life, new studies showed that combining three or more AIDS drugs in what became known as a cocktail sharply reduced the risk of HIV-related illness and AIDS-related death. This new approach became known as HART, Highly Active Antiretroviral Therapy. The development of the HART strategy and its very public unveiling in the 1996 International AIDS Conference in Vancouver, Canada, gave people living with HIV a reason to hope for a better future after many years of despair. The National Institutes of Health's Dr. Anthony Fauci was at the 1996 International AIDS Conference, not as an observer, but as one of the architects of the advent of heart. I knew what was going to be presented because the presentations were from investigators which we were funding. I'm, I'm the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and we had funded the clinical trials which showed that the triple combination was essentially giving durable control of HIV replication, making the virus undetectable. That was the first time that it had ever been reported. It was an amazingly exciting time, and I can remember when uh, it was announced that it literally was a transforming event. Uh, I was there, and it's a memorable thing that I don't think any of us will ever forget. Even though I knew what the results were before, to see it presented formally in an international audience was really a turning point in a, in a many years long struggle to finally have something that could truly durably suppress the virus. Dr. Julio Montaner of the British Columbia Center of Excellence in HIV in Vancouver, Canada, was among the researchers who presented new and exciting data regarding the efficacy of heart to save and prolong the lives of people living with HIV. As we were working towards the development of the scientific program for the International AIDS Conference that took place in Vancouver in 1996, it became apparent that uh, this was the news. A high viral load was associated with rapid disease progression. And naturally, low viral load was associated with a slow disease progression. And so we basically uh, put all of that together and concluded that triple therapy would be able to uh, render the viral load undetectable uh, in a very substantial number of people, in fact. This historic transition from hopelessness to hope is remembered by many AIDS pioneers, including Dr. Paul Volberding, founder of San Francisco's first HIV clinical ward. We suddenly entered the, the era of, you know, transformative therapy, where a previously uniformly fatal disease uh, suddenly was, was transformed, and people started not only to die more slowly, which ha had been the case, they actually started to recover. Um, and there are still people alive uh, who were near death uh, when they started on the triple therapy, as we called it, um, in 1996. Um, and, you know, they're the lucky ones. Cape Town, South Africa, faced many of the same struggles. Dr. Linda Gale Becker of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center said the discovery of effective HIV treatments gave patients a real sense of hope that they could not only survive, but actually improve their quality of life. When the drug was described as, as having a Lazarus effect, I, I truly bear testimony to that. It, it, you know, it's, it's been something that I think many people may not have ever witnessed, how you can go from really so little hope and so much darkness to a very different paradigm now with treatment. Um, and people are living normal lives and going back to having normal lives and having children and, and you know, fulfilling lives again. I think that's been extraordinary. There was, though, an important caveat to this transformation. 
The drugs used in the AIDS cocktail were prohibitively expensive for many living with the disease. While high-income countries could hope to afford the new HIV regimens, developing countries struggled to access these life-changing drugs. Even as AIDS-related deaths fell by over two-thirds in high-income countries after 1996, the annual death toll in low-income countries continued to worsen. Here again is Dr. David Sirwada of Uganda. I remember being in a meeting in Vancouver in 1996, one of the AIDS uh, annual big conferences, and uh, the results of the effect of triple therapy were first reported in those uh, in that meeting, 1996 Vancouver it was, in Canada, it suddenly brought a lot of hope to us. At that time, I remember my brother actually was actually infected with HIV and we were really struggling with what to do. But it was, it was a hope. But it was also discouraging because the treatment was extremely very expensive at the time. You know, it was being costed that uh, an annual treatment of triple therapy in 1996 uh, was really estimated at uh, $25,000 thereabout, including all the monitoring involved, which brought this hope completely out of reach of many African countries, let alone rural populations in Africa. So it was really a, a despair that was palpable uh, when one could see there was a hope. These differences in health outcomes between rich and poor nations were commonly viewed in the West at that time as a normal, albeit unfortunate, outcome of the way that drugs were developed. For decades, new drugs and vaccines were tested and developed in wealthier countries, but they often only became available in resource-limited countries after many years. But as the 20th century drew to a close, a new dynamic began to emerge. Activists argued that the unequal response to this global crisis was no longer tolerable. Activists began to advocate wider access to life-saving AIDS medication for every man, woman, and child in every country of the world. IAPAC's Dr. Jose Zuniga viewed the dilemma as one of health equity. So we began asking ourselves questions about equity, including among political representatives of developing countries, about how we could accept treatments being unaffordable in developing countries where the majority of people living with HIV AIDS lived. At the end of 97, 1997, two-thirds of people living with HIV were in Sub-Saharan Africa, and adding South and Central America and South and Southeast Asia to that calculations gave us 90% of the total number of persons living with HIV AIDS on the globe. In 1996, Brazil became the first developing country to pledge to provide free HIV treatment through its public health system. Brazil's leadership demonstrated that the miracles of HIV treatment need not be limited solely to the world's richest countries. From 1996 to 2002, it is estimated that Brazil prevented 60,000 AIDS deaths by providing universal access to HIV treatment. At the 2000 International AIDS Conference in Durban, South Africa, the theme, Breaking the Silence, urged the world to tackle the lack of access to HIV treatment and care in the countries and regions most heavily affected by HIV. The conference was electrified by the appearance of Nkosi Johnson, a 12-year-old South African boy who would eventually die of AIDS-related causes. At the conference, he urged his own government and the global community to provide life-saving treatment to all people living with HIV. We are normal. We are living beings. We can walk. We can talk. We are living. We are all the same. Thank you. At the Durban conference, generic pharmaceutical companies in India offered to manufacture less expensive generic alternatives to existing HIV drugs. Today, the cost of generic HIV regimens is 99% less than the cost of brand name HIV regimens in 2000. And leading pharmaceutical companies, heeding the call for increased access to HIV medications, have often cut the prices for their branded HIV drugs or entered into licensing agreements 
that enables generic manufacturers to produce less expensive HIV treatment options. Encouraged by the availability of more affordable antiretroviral drugs, the World Health Organization and UNAIDS in 2003 launched the 3 by 5 initiative. This campaign aimed to provide HIV treatment to at least 3 million people in low- and middle-income countries by December 2005. The 3 by 5 target crystallized a global HIV treatment movement that continues to this day. The 3 by 5 initiative was the first global HIV treatment target, but it would not be the last. In 2011, the global community pledged to ensure that 15 million would receive HIV treatment by 2015, a target that was met months before the deadline. Today, the world is fast-tracking the global AIDS response to link at least 30 million people with HIV to HIV treatment by 2020. Michelle Sidibe, whose agency, UNAIDS, created and supports the fast-track strategy, says that progress must be measured by more than just mere numbers. He emphasizes the importance of ensuring that no one is left behind in efforts to control and ultimately end the HIV epidemic. And we need also to make sure that we don't leave no one behind. AIDS will never be over until the epidemic is over for everyone. It will never happen. That's why I, I believe in a controlling epidemic will be a strong signal demonstrating that we have less new infection, we have more people on treatment, and uh, we are uh, going through process of uh, fast-tracking to really end this epidemic. Although today developed countries themselves are providing the majority of funding for their national AIDS responses, it was international donors who jump-started the global push to expand HIV treatment in developing countries. Advocated by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria was established in 2002, and it emerged as a key focal point to finance the scaling up of HIV treatment in developing countries. The Global Fund pools donations from dozens of countries and foundations providing grants directly to countries that submit scientifically sound proposals. In 2003, former U.S. President George W. Bush launched the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief Program. PEPFAR is the largest program that any single government has ever created to respond to a specific disease. As of September 2017, PEPFAR was supporting HIV treatment for more than 13 million people along with many other HIV-specific and related prevention, care, and support activities in more than 50 countries. While we will discuss the Global Fund and PEPFAR in future podcast episodes, it is important to recognize their impact in translating the promise of science into reality in developing countries. Today, the unprecedented response to the greatest public health challenge of modern times has achieved what more than three decades ago would have seemed unthinkable. In 2000, only 680,000 people worldwide, nearly all of them in high-income countries, were receiving HIV treatment. But by mid-2017, almost 21 million people living with HIV were benefiting from treatment and enjoying near-normal lifespans compared to the general population. In 2016 alone, an estimated 1.7 million deaths were averted as a result of expanded HIV treatment access, and countless billions of dollars of health expenditures were saved. Dr. Carl Diefenbach, director of the Division of AIDS at the U.S. National Institution of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, reflects on this historic achievement. Since HIV came on the scene in the early 80s, um, the progress that science <clears throat> in partnership with community, in partnership with the pharmaceutical industry has made profound um, advances that we are continuing to um, expand on and implement to the benefit of the world. We're in a situation right now where the glass is half full. Half the people in the world who need to be on therapy are. So you can look at that as two ways. It's either a success, that half, or we have much more work to do, and I, I fall in that camp. 
much more work to do. In our next episode, we will explore more about the current state of AIDS research. One important preview bears mentioning in this episode, though. Scientists have found that HIV treatment not only prevents illness and death, effective treatment also reduces new infections by preventing HIV transmission. Indeed, treating people living with HIV is central to the global goal of ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. Dr. Julio Montaner from Vancouver, Canada, is a leading researcher who was among the first proponents for using HIV treatment in combination with other prevention interventions. My hope is that we, the global community, would, will understand that we have a unique opportunity, uh, never in the history of public health, uh, we have had uh, such a tremendous opportunity. We, within a lifetime, we were hit by a pandemic that came out of nowhere. And uh, lo and behold, within our own lifetime, uh, we have the tools to put a major dent into that epidemic. Later in this podcast series, we will look at the role that cities have played in the quest to end AIDS. Cities must play just as vital of a role in ending the global HIV crisis today because they have been on the front lines of the AIDS response since day one. While much has changed scientifically since the early years of AIDS, one important factor persists as a major stumbling block in our response. The hysteria that greeted the new epidemic in the early 1980s has subsided, but stigma about HIV and prejudice toward the populations most heavily affected still deter people from getting the help they need. We will discuss the deleterious effects of stigma in more detail in our future episodes, not only about how it jeopardizes our efforts, but also about the ways that cities are working to eliminate stigma by involving communities in the Fast Track Cities initiative. The global fight against AIDS is a story for the ages, and that story is far from over. But it is increasingly clear that what began as a horrifying scourge can, in fact, be ended as a serious public health threat in our lifetimes. The AIDS response at the local level, spearheaded by local stakeholders in cities around the world, may well be the determining factor in whether our global community can end the HIV epidemic. Knowledge is power, so IAPAC encourages you to get tested for HIV. If you are diagnosed as negative but consider yourself at risk for acquiring HIV, consider ways to minimize your risk, including condom use and pre-exposure prophylaxis, otherwise known as PrEP. If you are diagnosed as HIV positive, have your clinical provider start you on HIV treatment as soon as possible after your diagnosis. HIV treatment today, taken as prescribed, can guarantee HIV positive individuals a near normal lifespan and, as important, prevent transmission of HIV by individuals who achieve viral suppression. Visit www.iapac.org for more detailed information.